but I mean, it's just, you know, unlike some other industries, I think comics is uniquely sort of poised to survive because of the sort of nature of the fandom and the nature of the people involved and the, you know what I mean? Hello and welcome to Comic Industry Insiders, the weekly podcast where we get to know the operators of the comics industry and tease out the tips and techniques to help you grow your career or business in comics. Our guest this week is Dirk Wood. There is no one in the comics publishing world that could be more accurately described as a rock star. Dirk has not so much climbed the corporate ladder as he swung from vine to vine only to power slide into one of the most crucial jobs in the largest independent publishing company in comics. Dirk's superpower is that everyone has a story about Dirk, and most of them will never be shared on the internet. Dirk's journey from comic store employee to a pivotal role in the international licensing at Image Comics offers rich lessons for career growth in any creative industry. Starting small, Wood's passion for comics drove his success, emphasizing the importance of building relationships, staying adaptable, and remaining humble. His experience underlies the value of what he calls his superpower, a strong work ethic and common sense. Friends and neighbors, my good friend, Dirk Wood. How are you doing? How are things? Things yeah. are great. Things are things are great. You know, it's pouring down rain here in Portland, Oregon. What else is new? It's like 38 yeah. degrees and raining sideways. But other than that, it's, it's lovely. I just, uh, you know, there are times living here in New York where the weather, especially in February, when, we, when we're recording yeah. this, it, when I'm just, I'm ready to just I'm, do anything, go anywhere other than live here. Uh, yeah. And I cannot, only, I can only imagine what it's like having as much rain as you guys have. It's a, it's yeah, a it's kind of a slog, you know. But I used to go to Toy Fair every year in February in New York as well, so I know how that goes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. At least we're not the, at the Javits Center right now. That's that's a that's a good point. You can Listen, I. Okay. We spent the, we spent a week just kind of going through everything we could find about you, doing some research, and wow. uh, you know, and I you know I asked around to people I'm talking to, and I swear to God I have no idea how to begin this this interview. Okay. Like most people, I I tend to ask them like, you know, just something to kind of get them warmed up. But like for you, man, I, I th- as far as I, I think that we just kind of have to start at things from another world, right? I mean, that's where this all started yeah. for you. I guess so. You know, that that's right? I started working at. It was called Pegasus Books and back in the day, but I was started. Really? Okay. Yeah, I, start, I started working at Pegasus Books for Pat Richardson, who's a good friend of mine still to this day, Mike Richardson's brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, Beavers and Pegasus Books in October of 1993. So October of 93. Yeah, wow. so just past the 30 year mark of this goofy career, you know. <laughs> You know yeah, what? I think you were. I think you started working there. Maybe I don't. I don't. It was right after my birthday, which would have been October '93, that I started working at uh, Brave New World. So I think right. we like both started working at a counter in at the same time in a comic book yeah, shop. That's we, crazy. We, we started during comics industry collapse number twelve. Exactly. Now Fifteen, <laughs> right, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> We both jumped onto the wave as it was already cresting and was crashing down on everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, but yeah. That's crucial. That, it, and that sort of informs a lot of, I'm, I'm guessing this is true for you too, but that informs a lot of my knowledge ever since, you know? Yeah, sure. Into that fire and that era of comics, you know? Well, especially yeah. when you're dealing with people who have never dealt with like, you know, the a kind of a, a recession or whatever, like a downturn. Uh, right. you just like, yeah, I've been through this. I came in on this. I was born in this fire, baby. You know, I was That's born right. in the darkness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So tell me about that. Like you, so you start working at the, at, uh, Pegasus, right? Yeah. Yep. And they immediately say, who is this like a uh, child with, uh, the voice nice. of uh, Wolfman Jack. Right. And they say, promote that guy. Right? Is that how that goes? Yeah, it wasn't immediate, though. You know, it, was sort of, it, was, it, it took quite a while. At first, I was just a guy with long hair and two pierced ears, and, you know. Um, gotcha. But I, I worked there in Beaverton for close to a year. Then I ran the Hollywood store for about a year and then moved into the offices in Milwaukee, 
where I was basically working out of the Dark Horse offices and then sooner or later ended up at Dark Horse, you know. And so, and as a serious aside, I would have to thank Mike Richardson to this day, you know, and I, yeah. I just saw Mike recently, he's doing well, but like I, without that guy launching that business here in my hometown, what would I be doing? Who knows? Sure. You know, do, I don't know. Not that there's was there a moment? moment? Was there a moment where you just kind of went from, uh, you know what, I, you know, I'm enjoying just working at a counter at a comic shop, the moment where you just like wanted more, like, did you, yeah, did you have you know, that? it's funny. I mean, I, I, at that point in my life, like I, I, working at a comic shop felt like hitting the lottery in itself, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. And I, I spent so many years working in restaurants as a young man. Oh. Yeah, same. Hard I same. felt like if I can ever not work in restaurants, then oh I will be happy. And so just to have a, a retail job, I was thrilled and I loved comics. So it was just, it yeah. was great. And then it just sort of naturally, I just kind of ping ponged my way through the industry. And after I started, you know, getting a little bit of success or whatever, then I started getting a little, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was overly ambitious, but I started getting some ambition about like, hey, I like this. I'm sure. good at this. I want to do this. I want to pursue it, you know. When do you think that was? Like, was that was that when it moved oh, into the Dark Horse office? Some, sometime before the turn of the century. Yeah, sometime <laughs> before the century. Maybe to know everybody. And there were a few people at Dark Horse. Diana Schutz is someone I should mention that just sure. that recognized something in me pretty early on. They were like, yeah. I like this kid. You, you seem to know comics. You should, you know. And so, uh, yeah. Diana, then, for everybody, just to pause there, Diana's a legendary editor. Oh, like yeah. legendary she she i mean so much of what we see now in comics came from her eye yeah oh so. for sure and i love diana and so it, i i felt like wow you know because she was a rock star back then anyway sure. so for her to even talk to me i would feel like wow diana shits is talking to me like you know <laughs> and then I, I my first san diego comic-con was 97 which i did for things from another world okay and then i was next thing you know i was hanging out with diana and bob shrek yeah, and going to Eisner after parties and meeting all these oh people who were my comic book heroes, and I was just like, okay, this is you know, I'm not sure I was smart enough to really think I could do the things I ended up doing, or even uh, you know. But as soon as I started, there there was you know, I'm you sure you felt up. similar when you when you left, you know, the the sort of retail side and got into the publishing side. You know, I mean, sure, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, for me, it came out of uh, that that was a second or third drop of 2008 um you know yeah. uh we you know won the eisner and immediately the economy crashed and you know right. two years later i had to find a job um basically yeah. that's how it worked but once i got in like once i got my first my toehold you're like oh yeah i know how this works i get this yeah. this is this is uh yeah and, and i'm guessing you put some word to me on this too which is the and this is this is a true side but i any success I have had in comics at all, I attribute all of it to starting in retail. And mm. like completely. That and you know, when I when I started working with the direct market a lot when I was a dark horse first, then IDW later. I'm sure we'll get into that. But uh right. you know, that I was sort of became the direct market advocate in some, not that there weren't others, but I was a direct market mm. advocate within those publishers and tried to institute things that made sense for the people on the front lines, you know? Yeah. And and so I, I think without that I'm not sure what I would have done. You know, for me I, I you know, uh, it always felt like being a translator. Right. I learned yeah. how to speak retailer. I learned how to speak, you know, comics as a fan. Then I learned how to speak retailer. And then I learned how to translate that for publishing. And, yeah. you know, and then and then once you're in publishing, you start learning all these other new languages and you're just essentially translating for everyone because right. all of it starts to make sense when you see the whole board. Right. Right. And so yeah. it's funny you say that because now I do international licensing, which is sort of the sort of for, for me is the pinnacle of that translation issue you know i want to get to that i don't want to get oh, to yeah. that but i also you know i will say my time in valiant i watched watched russ brown work licensing and man i just felt like i should i should have learned that that's what i should have learned but i it's, you know there's plenty of time yeah. <laughs> no no, no it, it yeah. was interesting like but it but it's funny you know it, it as much as retail has changed and it's yeah. changed drastically in several phases since you and i were in it especially sure since has. i was 
And uh, but the but the the core tenets of it, I think, remain the same. You know, yeah. I, I'm feeling particularly out of the loop at the moment on direct market stuff, just because it's been three years since I've really dealt with anything, and then like six years since I was super involved. Right. So I'll hear things, but you know, I, I, at its heart, it's people. Plus, you, know? you guys have. I mean, you've got Alex Cox there, and if there's anybody who knows, right. you know, retail you know, you retail. Walk in and walk out, but he was just here. <laughs> Yeah. If there's anybody who knows that world better than you and I, it's Alex. Like he is, is he's Alex. doing an amazing job over there. That's, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So you so you join you're still a dark horse, right? We're, well, let's do that. And then so where, where what are the once you start uh like moving into the executive into offices, course. right? Exactly. Yeah. You stop managing stores. What is it? What, sorry, is your first gig like working in direct market or is it, what no, is it? In fact, my first gig was just direct sales and, and primarily I was selling to the military, like the, the stores oh. overseas. I was yeah. doing like clamshell collections of comics overseas okay. and, and a lot of like gift shop stuff. Yeah. Like I was sort of the outreach to the markets beyond comics and then but i was also started running trade shows at that time right and so it would sort of bled over so i ended up like you know i was doing direct sales but then and then next thing you know i'm working on retailer summit stuff and it just sort of happened naturally and then i think it was 2003 i got the i became director of marketing there gotcha. and then went pretty much full but i never you know i was a direct market kid i was a comic shop kid so it was it was never far from my mind you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And then I was Involved, and then just got more and more and more involved. But I always worked with the book market too. At the same time, you know, yeah, on the, one way or another. Right. Well, I think that's right about the time that I uh, that you kind of hit my radar. Right. Was yeah, uh, was probably. this? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you're one of the first. I think the, well, one of the things that I um, I find the most interesting about our world is that you know we all have. I mean, I, I refer to you as kind of a rock star, right? But and that's you know it's a little a little tongue in cheek, but also you know you're a legitimate musician. We can get it. We're gonna dig well, into that, but uh, I'm but um, <laughs> but uh, but inside of our world, like there are people, they're like the kind of micro celebrities, right? You work with an, if you are a comics, you work at a publishing you know uh, office, and you work with direct market retailers, like you become a personality for them, right? You become well, someone they follow. You know, there are like, yeah. there, there a couple thousand retailers who know who I am beyond that. You know, if you read Previous Magazine, you would have seen my little cartoon back in the day. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. I do remember that very well. So, well, uh, yeah. I, well, I was just, for, for, you know, like I, getting to know, like I felt some pressure right off the bat in terms of that because when, when you're a, a publisher going to these retailer summits, for example, and you will know this. Sure. Sure. That you, know, you get up on stage in front of a couple hundred people and it's there's a, a weird power dynamic because they know who you are and you don't know necessarily right. who they are. So I tried to make that a big thing like when I would because I always felt weird if I get in an elevator at Comics Pro or something and so would be like, hey, and not have no idea who they were. And so I never really right. particularly enjoyed that. Like I was like, I want to. And so because of that, I've made friends as you have, you know, all over the sure. industry. Like, and I think that's that remains my, my favorite part of the job, you know? Uh, yeah, mine too, right? It's the, it's the people, right? It's, uh, it's yeah. you know, them knowing who you are and then you being able to lean in and say, uh, all right, but who are you? Tell me about you. Tell me about your shop. Tell me about your family, right? You get to know them. Right. It's, uh, yeah. And sometimes it's not great to have any sort of notoriety with those guys because it just oh, yeah. means they're going to be like, hey, the staples, you know, on the Star Wars comics are falling out, you know, and it's like, oh, sorry, man. Okay. You know? Yeah. I, I I can't believe I failed so horribly with that stapler. I, I'm right. so sorry, sir. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't tell you, like my first ever retailer summit. It might, I did the morning Q&A and I was shocked at how yeah. many people were there and I don't remember what it was but I had not met Phil Boyle yet oh, Phil if you're watching goodness. you know I love you but like <laughs> Phil just did my first question he just came out screaming at me like, you know and I was just like yeah came out swinging you know? yeah oh yeah you know and uh, yeah. it was something about like we I, you know we didn't have a second printing in the 
you know, indicia of the second printings of Serenity or something like that. I was like, sorry, we'll get it fixed, you know. But, <laughs> but that's what I mean, right? It's it's is that translation, right? And then yeah. you go back to the office and you say, look, this is this is important because you know they they can't like they can't right. do their jobs if we don't do that part of our job right. You know, right. so I, you begin to understand how those little details ripple out, right. um, and you know, and Phil. Yeah, Phil has called me on many things over the years, and is uh, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I find love Phil. I want to be clear about I do that. too. I yeah, do too. Yeah. He'll, he'll let you know. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. You never, you yeah. never have to worry about where you stand with Phil. Yeah. That's right. Um. So was it okay? I got to ask. So you're doing that. You're doing Comics Pro. You mentioned that uh, the oh, Comics yeah. Pro annual meeting that has happened now for what twenty years? I think they just did the twentieth, and I, I think, think it's so, the first. Yeah, right. Yeah, I was at the first one. And I was I, too. I, yeah, I went to all of them up through the pandemic. In fact, the Comics Pro in Portland right before the pandemic hit. Oh, yeah. Was a, you remember that? That was a I real, remember. you know, it was just like, yeah, there's this thing coming. Pow. You know, oh, that was sort of the last event. Uh, I, you know, I think, I don't know. I I missed this year. Just it was just last weekend. And I, I missed know, this year, but I think that was the first time I've missed one. I think I'm not sure. I need to go back and check. But uh, yeah, yeah, I missed last year's as well. So I basically, uh, after the pandemic, I've missed the in-person's one. But it, that's a real hole in my sort of existence. I love Comics Pro. I love the auction. You know, that was fun. I was about to say the the yeah. auction. Famously, you have been the auctioneer for I have no idea how long. Uh, it it just wasn't long. the same without you. Yeah. yeah. I never thought I was going to, I, I, when Alex actually asked me to do it, you yeah. know, whatever year that was. And, uh, I was like, I don't have an experience of auctioneer. I mean, you know, but it ended up being a blast and we did it every year for oh so God. long. You know? Yeah. No, I miss that. So much fun. Everybody's yeah. having an amazing time and throwing around way too much money. Yeah. Uh, I think I actually bought two of the things on the wall behind me at that auction. So there you go. Oh, did you? There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I got this uh, this this guy from from uh, DC and this guy from Image. So yeah, there yeah. you go. Ah, I just really both have Dinesh. What's that? Dinesh. Surprise you outbid Dinesh or Baruch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christina at uh, DCBS or uh, slash Lunar really wanted this. Yeah, I had to. Oh, yeah. I went. I went probably a little too hard. A little too strong for it, yeah. um, which is why I have to use it in every recording now to justify uh, having spent so much. So, oh, yeah. so 2010, right around there, IDW gives yes. you a call. Yeah, how's yeah. that go? Yeah. How, what's that experience like? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, like, I've had the good fortune, luck, and had some foresight that I just—it was the right place for me at the right time. Yeah. You know, and and. The, the crazy thing is, like, I still have a zillion friends at Dark Horse, you know. I went to Chris Warner's retirement party a couple of weeks ago and saw Mike and Neil and everybody. And it's like, you know, I was able to leave that after 16 years working for Mike, yeah, to be, which was a long time, to be able to leave with, you know, and not burn those bridges and still have friends there. And, you know. Right. And, but because IDW, it just, they were up and coming at that time, you know, yeah. and we're just a good place to be. And uh, Ted, I, you know, if I had to thank a second person for my career, it would be Ted. My, Mike and Ted would be, you know, um, sure. just a, an absolute business genius, great guy. and was, you know, wonderful to work for. And then I met a ton of friends there, you know. And right. so I was, I was the, ultimately I was the VP of marketing for like seven years there. And then moved up to Portland to start Full Bleed and all that, which we could probably get into, but right. which is sort of a whole you know, odd shift and, and change. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I look back on all that time super fondly, you know. And then the, the, the image thing sort of happened in a similar way. Like it was just the right place to be at the right time, you know. I remember, I remember talking to Alex a lot during that period where you guys were about to jump over in a weird package yeah. deal. But before we get there, um, yeah. I do want to say you had, a, uh, I think, a unique experience, at least, was it, so at what point did you move from San Diego back to Portland? You're still working was, for IDW. It was December of 2016. December of yeah. 2016. So you've been there it for like six crazy. years. Yeah. 
Yeah. So at that time, I mean, this this is all personal stuff I wouldn't bore anyone with, but I was commuting back and forth from Portland and San Diego, and it was just crazy. And, and you know, I just ran out of steam on that and just couldn't – I couldn't keep it going anymore. It and sounded so exhausting. I, yeah, I, so you I were went, you were legitimately in San Diego four or five days a week, yeah. flying home to Portland, Oregon yeah. for the weekends, and then re- returning – Every every week for how long? Yeah. How long did I you do that? San Diego on Friday afternoon and fly back to Portland on Monday morning. Take the first flight into San Diego, and then I had a unique set of circumstances happening for me I would not get into that made that all possible. Sure, but I did that for six and a half years. Which six and really, a half years you did that uh-huh. from July of 2010 till December of 2016. Is that right? Maybe is that five and a half years? No, that's, that's six and a half years. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I have no idea. Oh, it was wow. crazy. I mean, and there was a time in the middle of that when I would just I, I felt like a ghost in an airport. You know, I'm sure. you were, as you would remember, I was traveling elsewhere too. Right, so it was it was just on the road constantly, and my and a lot of that I loved, but eventually it grinds on you. you oh, know? I know. Yeah. I mean, there was so, there was one year at Valiant. I was out for like nineteen weekends out of the year, and like yeah. you know, at first it's great. You know, traveling is oh, wonderful. You get to see all these amazing cities, meet all these crazy people, right? Uh, oh, but yeah. man, it's Pretty soon you're like, I can that. only imagine. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> How's my cholesterol high? Where's my money What's going on? You know. <laughs> yeah. it used to be a little bit much. So I, I sort of went to Ted just with that, you know, like. I got to get out of here, you know, and I didn't, but Ted, like to his credit and, you know, and my luck was just like, open a Portland office. I can't lose you. We're going to, and then he's like, you and I will do something together. And that's what full bleed came about, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And then I found this office, which came in later. Let's talk about full full bleed. Like, tell yeah. me about that. Because that was, it was a beautiful, beautiful magazine. Well, thank you. You guys did such good work on there. You know, but. and I'm still really proud of it. It, it, it. But it was, boy, it was a ton of work. You know? What? That was a ton of work. And I, you know, I, I have no regrets about that whole thing other than to say I would do some things differently if I did it again. That, you know, I think I overshot a few ideas. I mean, we could get into all that. I'd love I, to. Like, no, let's dig into that because that's that. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. I think the format was just too daunting for what I was trying to to do, and that you know, I was basically. I mean, for those people watching this who don't know what it was, it was a, it was a twenty five dollar hardcover magazine, but it was formatted like a magazine, you know, and you had comics and fiction and interviews and all sorts of different stuff. But it was never meant to be read cover to cover. But I think a lot of people because it came off like a book felt like they had to read it like a book. And, and I always felt that, you know, like you don't pick up a copy of whatever Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, you don't pick up a copy of, ma- of a magazine and just read it cover to cover. You jump into right. things you're most interested in, you know, it should have been more. And then like if it sits there long enough, you, you, you read the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. It was meant to be like that. And so I think it was, the format was just a little bit daunting for people and, it, you know, and, and, and it was tough, you know, it, it, there was a huge cost to produce it. Uh, uh, they mm-hmm. basically ended up, I wouldn't bore you with the specifics, but those books, they, they paid for themselves. They made a little bit of money, but it was such a large undertaking. You sure. know? And I was sort of marooned up here on my own in Portland and try, you know, and, and quite understandably, everybody in San Diego was like, what is he doing up there? You know? So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, you know, I, it was great. I'm proud of the books. You know, I put a lot of work into those and like, you know, I got to work with some incredible people and, you know, it, 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 it was a ton of fun. You know, but I, I get asked often, like if I'm going to do something like that again, or every once in a while I get asked, sure. to do and I don't know, maybe, you know, if the opportunity presented itself, I don't know, but it's like, it, it was a ton of work. It's an interesting problem though, right? It's, you know, the anthology is one of those things in publishing where everybody feels like, I mean, there was a period when I was consulting with like three different companies and each one of them came to me in the same week and said, hey, we want to do an anthology. 
I was like, right. this is crazy. Where what's in the water, right? right. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, it's just so difficult to find readership like for that. Yeah. Like, it's so difficult. I mean, it, editorially, each one of those stories takes up as much time, really, as much time as it would take if you were if it was the one story oh, throughout. Yeah. You no, know, this is, this is completely true. And then, and we, it was in a way, it was almost even crazy, more ambitious because you had articles that needed spot illustrations you had interviews you yeah. had that needed to be transcribed you had like like the, every, every single story in one of those books had its own set of issues and scenarios and it was super rewarding because when something came out and it was super cool you know sometimes it was my idea sometimes it was the creator's idea sometimes it was ted's yeah. idea and you, you would be surprised by what came out of it and it was gratifying but oh my god it was a ton of work yeah so, <laughs> if, if you had it, if you oh. had it to do it again, though, if you if you, yeah. I mean, because I'm sure it was satisfying. I mean, all of that, like, anytime you get to use a lot of different skills, it's always satisfying professionally, right? It makes yeah. you, it you know, opens your brain up. Um, if you had it to do it again, like, what are the what are the big takeaways? Like, what you know, so gun to your head, you got to put out an anthology, right? Where where do you where do you go with that? Boy, you know, I, that's a really good question because I think, well, we, you know, it, just as I said, we had a lot of ambitions that, that with that, that we never really got a chance to get to for lots of reasons, plenty of which were my fault, but sure. it really, the magazine, the hardcovers themselves were supposed to sort of almost be a loss leader to generating just a ton of stuff. Right. right. And, and it was it was a unique uh, the, to get into the weeds a little bit, but that's what your podcast is all about. Yeah, I think. please. I, mean, uh, I have to thank Chris Staros because at, at the at Chris, brilliant editor for Top Shelf. So, you know, and IDW, Chris gave me some advice right away. I was talking to him about the contracts with different creators. Yeah. And he basically lent me it. And I hope I'm not speaking out of school for this. I doubt it. But basically that, you know, the it's the top shelf model, which is that the creators, you know, retain their work completely, but then you get to sort of the rights and perpetuity to print it. So like okay. the, the, the deals for full bleed that were basically like, you know, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars to produce this thing. You own it, right. but we can, but we can print it in collections and, you know, in our stuff, but, but your, it's your creation. You can, if you sell it to a TV show, put it in another book, whatever you want to do with it. But we also can put it in the best of full bleed or whatever. And so, so they the could print it and they could also, I mean, I get the, you know, the idea that everybody wants to hang on to the IP for, you know, maybe movies and licensing and whatnot. But right. what you're saying is like, they could print it elsewhere sure. as well yeah. as you. Right. Well, that's interesting. Like, like, you know, I did it. Uh, if you know, Aaron nations, brilliant creator, there's a book called so. gumballs for IDW top shelf. Oh yeah. Uh, I know that book. Yeah. Aaron, lovely, lovely person. Lovely guy. Um, so he did a short story for us that if he wanted to include that in a, and I'm, this is, a, I'm just making this up, but if Aaron wanted sure. to include that in a, in a gumballs book, he could. You know, but gotcha. we would also be able to put it in the best of full bleed or the best short stories or, or whatever. So the idea was to gotcha. just generate so much stuff, so much good stuff that you could have them, you know, the best of the interviews, the best of the rock and roll comics, the best of this stuff, and, and sort of, you know, have just multiple keep repackaging and repackaging and repackaging. Yeah. And then we also wanted to have a website where it was sort of like, you know, we, we do the magazine, but, but it's almost like an open submissions portal for like, you know, aspiring creators to be, sure. you know, putting together things that, that we just launch on the full bleed website, but then the best of that stuff makes it into the book. And we had a bunch of ideas and things we wanted to do and never got to that phase. Yeah. So I think if I was going to do anything like that differently, I would I would probably stick with an idea similar to that, but make the format of the book a little more accessible. You know, mm, yeah. uh, maybe the maybe the price point, maybe a soft cover, maybe it's a, you know it's a newsstand item. Maybe so it really is a loss leader, but it allows you to do all this other stuff. I don't know. That's something interesting to think about. But yeah. Also, I'm 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 remembering. And we may cut this part out because if because you may say no, I didn't. But um, I'm remembering what didn't you guys do some sort of crowdfunding for oh, that yeah, book? 
Uh, yeah. Oh, and that's another thing I will tell you is I will never do another Kickstarter for the rest of my life. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, but, tell me why. But let me let me be square about this. That is only for my own personal bandwidth reasons. That that I, sure. I think you know crowdfunding and that sort of thing is especially with the way the world has gone is a very valuable thing for sure. people that use that. Like, and I, I'm not going to disparage it at all. I, however, don't ever want to do it again. Because we, <laughs> we did yeah. four of them. And, you know, the, the first one was super successful. It had $100,000, which at the time was, was great, yeah. you know. But then because we were doing four volumes, it – put me on the hook to do three more Kickstarters, which of course had, you know, right. diminishing returns each time, understandably. Right. You know? Right. And uh, yeah, it, it's just anybody that's run a Kickstarter. Have you, Adam? Have you run a I Kickstarter? Have. I've been mm -hmm. involved in Kickstarters and well, you know, you I probably know. will be again. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's a ton of work. It is know? a ton of work. I will it say is, that, that it's a ton of work. I think that my biggest lesson in running, working with Kickstarters is there's a lot of work up to the point of the day, right? The day mm -hmm. that it launches. And that's when most of the money gets made. Uh, but right. every dollar after that is just labor. Yes. Right. It's just, you know, it's, it's just yeah. doing the grind. It's just getting out there and saying, how else are we going to promote this thing and get, to get oh, people's yeah. attention, and, you know? And, it's, and look, it, like, you know, I think it's valuable and I would not, but it is, it sure. is rough, you know, it, oh, it, yeah. it's tough slogging, but like anything, it's, it's sort of, you get, you get out of it, what you put into it. Exactly. So, exactly. But yeah, it, it is, it, you are pushing that boulder up the mountain and, you know, so. It's a, you know, the reason I brought it up is it's something that I've uh, really, I, I've come to believe, I mean, you and I come from comic shops. We both value comic shops. We both value yeah. the direct market. And this is, I know, kind of controversial in comic shops is social, right. I mean, is, you know, crowdfunding. Um, you know, well, I think that there's always been that like direct to consumer component that's always a little bit like, oh, I, well, I'm not crazy about you guys selling, but I get it. You're running a business. But something well, about you know, crowdfunding just gets them going, you know? It's funny you mention that. And that's another thing. And that, you know, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. But one thing I tried to do, and I'm pretty sure I was the first person to do this hmm. at the time, um, was that we had, I tried to give the, do retailer tiers. There were other retailer right. tiers, but, but I, we were the first ones to do it where you could place your Kickstarter order and it would be fulfilled by Diamond at oh, the time. Right. right. Cool. So... Yeah. You know, that and, and that we tried to make it, you know, as advantageous for the retailer as we could. And at that point, it was sort of like, this is a marketing thing, you know. And I think it, sure. it was true at the time. We, we just felt like, you know, that if we just solicited that book. And I wanted to do, uh, yeah. yeah, that's another thing I wanted to get to was doing some, like, direct market only stuff. You know, right. different versions, of, you know, that kind of a thing. Um but we felt that that first launch, it was just the Kickstarter thing really was a marketing thing. You know, it was just yeah. sort of like, we got to get at that out there. And, you know, I mean, we sold 3,000 copies of the first volume and we sort of felt like a $25 hardcover. We probably would have sold 900 hundreds. of them. Maybe. maybe. Maybe you would have cracked 1,000. Um, it would have been yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we sold a lot of them into the direct market via that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, this is, a, you know, I'm going to, this is my hot take, you know, right? This is the piece that we're going to probably yank out and I'm probably going to get in trouble because it goes on social. But <laughs> I really truly believe that, like, Berserker, let's take that for example. Boom put out Berserker with uh, Keanu Reeves. Massive hit, massive yeah. hit on the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. then a massive hit in the direct market. This yeah. is not the first time that a celebrity has, like, you know, a headlined a comic book. This is not right. this is not unique. Keanu Reeves is a big deal, but he's not that big a deal. No, and sure. I don't no, think I don't think it becomes nearly as big in the direct market without that Kickstarter, without that campaign. I, and I think, I think we've seen that right. several other places too. Yeah, you know. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's interesting, and I, I think you guys were pioneering that as well. I think it's really trying to. really I'm fascinating. Sure it all worked as well as we wanted it to, but you know, sure. it, was, it was the thought that counts. That's right. Exactly. You're trying shit. Yeah. Some of it works. Some of it doesn't work. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you're, so now you, you're settled in, you're in Portland, right? 
you build this office. Can we talk about this office? Because I've been in, I've been in warehouses. I've been in offices. I've been in every place that people do business in comics all over the country. Yeah. Um, I can honestly say that your office that has like two people working in it is perhaps <laughs> my, it could be, but you could, you guys could put like a dozen people in there without them bumping into it, bumping elbows. Yeah. Uh, but it is possibly the coolest clubhouse I have ever been in. Well, thank you. Um, you know, and let me say, uh, before we even go further with this, I, I, I want to say this is, you know, it's been fortuitous timing throughout and that it worked really well for what it worked, especially up until the pandemic. And when I left IDW, it was working really well and how it became the image office is just completely fortuitous timing because of the pandemic and, and, yeah. and Eric Stevenson, who is the greatest, you know, it, image had to, to shrink their operations in terms of their own, terms of their own office space, which was huge. And everybody right. was working from home, you know, and it just so happened that I became available. Alex became available and the lease was expiring on this office all at the same time. And so really more than anything, and I don't look a gift horse in the mouth because it made a very easy transition for me, yeah. but it was a perfect place. And, and it is, I, I love this place. I wouldn't, I, I would never say I don't, but it was a perfect transitional spot during the pandemic. And for sure. what, everything that everybody is going through, including image, but moving forward, we'll see. I mean, the, the, you know, as the world comes more and more and more alive image may have, you know, we may have other needs that go beyond this, you know, right. and it may end up moving in it, but it certainly served a great purpose in the meantime. And I love it. You know, it uh, was, you know, yeah, it was just sort of a fortuitous thing. I mean, it, you know, and Eric, I've been friends with Eric for a long time. You know, or known him. I've been an admirer of him, and I've been a bit of an admirer of Image for thirty years. So, like sure. that was, you know, we just started talking, and sort of this all transpired. You know, and and but for me personally, it was also the job. You know, taking over international licensing that I have been enamored with that with this position since back in the day. And and I, I got to give a shout out to Lance Kreider. You mentioned boom. So Lance was my yeah. old pal at Dark Horse and he had the, four, the the international licensing job at Dark Horse and then we shared an office and I traveled with him a lot and and right. so I went to all of those trade shows and I was so jealous of his job you know yeah. I was so yeah. jealous of what he got to do that I'm like to find myself doing it all these years later it's just you know it's always been in the back of my mind that I might end up doing this job somewhere yeah it's a um, right. so got to, international you know, International licensing. Let's let's cover that because I think a lot of people, especially if you're in, uh, if you're just a consumer, or you, even if you're a retailer, even many people in publishing themselves don't really understand how this works. Yeah. So give us the 101. How does international licensing work? Well, yeah, boy, I should have really foreseen that that question. Yeah. I had a, a canned answer, but no, I mean it, it's 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 specifically interesting for me here at Image because you know. I mean, as you would be well aware, Image has just, you know, is very creator friendly, you know? Oh, yes. And, and everything that happens at Image is for the creators, basically. Um, right. So, so I, Image, I, for the audience, just to give them the moment, right? Uh, yeah. So far, you've worked at IDW, which owns its own uh, properties, does some creator owns, also licenses some books. Right. Uh, you've worked at Dark Horse, again, the same. They own some properties. They do some creator owns. They license some books. Image is very specific in its, in its uh, mandate in that it only works on books that are owned by the creators. Or right. I suppose now that you're working, uh, that uh, Skybound is doing so many licenses, there's probably a little bit of overlap there. Right. But, well, it's interesting. It's also because, you know, Skybound's a separate company, you know. Right. And, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Image to me, it always feels, and this is in no way an official statement. It's like my own brand thinking, but image is almost like a confederation of these companies, you know. But image itself sure. would, only does creator owned stuff. Yeah. You know? So when my first job in publishing back, we talked about 2008 or 2010 when I went into publishing. My first job was at, to work at uh, Top Cow um, right. uh, with Mark and Matt yeah. and their wow. crew. 
and um, and eventually was uh, laid off so that they could take the, the marketing and sales and all of those jobs and essentially give them to Image Central because, you know, sales just were not there. Right. Know? But um, but yeah, it's it, it, but so each one of these studios runs as a studio. They own the IP. They, you know, create yeah. new content and then they take it to Image. Image handles the sales, the licensing, the licensing, the foreign licensing. They, right. they handle the, the actual printing and distribution and all of this stuff and talking to retailers. Right. That's what right. Alex does. So, right. And, you know, yeah. it, it, it's interesting. So, I mean, it was a bit of an adjustment for me understanding that after after having been a Dark Horse and IDW that like, oh, wait, no, you know, because I mean, Dark Horse and IDW were both creator friendly in their own ways at that time. Sure. But, it, you know, realizing like, oh, no, 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 this mission is for the creators. Like, really? You know, this is this is pure. So so what I do and this to come back to your question about what I do in the international yeah. license thing. You know, I almost act as if I'm an agent for the creator, you know? Okay. That, that, you know, so, I mean, let's, any one of, of these, you know, and we have a ton of great books, obviously, but any, you know, if I'm taking Saga, you know, for Brian and Fiona, and sure. then there's going to be, you know, they, you know, Saga's got fans in Hungary and France and Spain and brazil and you name it and so i i essentially become a conduit between the publishers in those countries and the creator gotcha. and you know it, it is so it, if if an image book is published internationally chances are I'm, I'm dealing with it there are exceptions to that in fact like the license stuff at skybound i don't deal with they handle that with hasbro themselves things like that right. um and top cow is a good example they actually go, use another agent so, oh, but the, interesting. But yeah, okay. the vast majority of, and the, and it just goes back some of these relationships have gone back 30 years or people have used different, you know, and so it, it's a, it's a very small pool. I think there's, I don't know, six or seven of us in the country that do this for comics. I don't know. I mean, maybe a couple more than yeah. that, but, no, uh, not a, not yeah. a ton more, especially yeah. when, you know, when you get into yeah. the, at the agents themselves, you know? Yeah, sure. It, but it's it's very specialized, but it, but it's it's fascinating to me at least because every one of these countries has a different sort of market. Everyone yeah. has a different history of publishing. You know, it, it, everything is sold differently in different places. Every you know, and it's uh, yeah, I feel you know a lot of it. And I, one of the reasons I think Eric hired me for the job when we started talking about it is that I did have that experience in Dark Horse for years. I was tangentially involved with licensing stuff sort of throughout and i right. knew a lot of people you know at panini and Planet, uh, different different companies around um so i want to take a digression here for just a second and then i yeah. do want to come back here and get all the way in the weeds all right so i'm going to okay. give you the heads up so you can have part of your brain processing this because i'd love to t start digging into what are the deal points in an international license like what sure. is it that people talk about and again, if anything you don't want, I don't want you to reveal anything proprietary, you know, no, no, no. anything that's, that's going to piss off Eric or your other creators. But no, no, no. yeah, I do, but do want to get into that. But before we do, I want to talk about the experience that you had in uh, uh, getting to know this sort of international community, right? Right. So you talked about doing trade shows. I think you were probably you were initially setting things up and you know, doing that kind of um, set up and promotion and breakdown and all of that and wrapping pallets. And I imagine you spent oh, yeah. plenty of time doing that. Um, but you have a very, I mean, I, we actually talked about it on this show. We had Ku Yu Lang uh, oh, sure. on for an interview oh. and we talked about his, uh, his role as your, basically your promoter and bringing right. people to your show the business of comics is a is a network of relationships, right? Every piece of it is a network of relationships. Every, yeah. I mean, from from the conception all the way down to the the person who puts it in the bag for you and takes your money at the register, it's right. just it's just this interpersonal thing, um, yeah, and every and piece know, of it gets yeah, intricate. Yeah, yeah please. You know, well, I was going to say a lot of these things that just sound like they're done for sheer fun. You know, while right. they are fun, I mean, for example, the auctions at Comics Pro, like I always like 
you know, that sure. was a way for me to get to know all the retailers and they had a good time and we had a good time and that, that you know, and yeah. I remember their names and I've, you know, and they remember mine and we, you know, and, and it's, it's, there, it's sort of a, and not that it's cynical in that way. Like we're just only doing these things to, right. you know, but, but it, it's just, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, and it, 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 it's being able to do things that, uh, you know, are, are good times for people that are memorable within the context of their business life. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I do think it's a, you could, you could go into this business with a purely mercenary. I'm going to give you my business card. I'm going to take your business card. We, you know, I'm going to yeah. let you know when I, you could, or you could spend the time, which I think you and I both have done of just getting to know the people. Right. Yeah. And seeing them as people. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that, that gets to be difficult when you get really close to people in, in any capacity and they go out of business or some, yeah. you know, someone goes away or something, you know, it's like, I mean, yeah. it's life it becomes like a big family, you know, it surely does. And, truly. and watching people go through hard things is, you know, that's part of things too. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. But that's it. thank you for bringing that up. It's, of course, it, it, of course. On memories, right. Koo always had a good time. <laughs> I definitely believe that. Uh, uh, I'm going to shift gears hard and go back to the story that to, to the conversation that I wanted to uh, mentioned earlier. Okay. So you now work in international licensing. So at what point do you start like getting to know that that you, you started getting to know that at dark horse and then through IDW yeah. or yeah, was it just like, eh, I can figure this out. What's yeah. yeah. You know, more, much more a dark horse than IDW, but it, it's so I was, as I mentioned, I would travel with them. We do these shows and then, you know, I'd be at comic con and then, you know, a lot of the, the foreign publishers would show up at comic con and, and you know, I, I, I meet them in Frankfurt or Bologna and then they'd be here and, you know, up through the magic of social media, you connect with, you know, and, and so I've just known a lot of, of international publishers for a long time. Yeah. And, and then I watched, I sat right next to Lance and watched him negotiate all of these deals. And right. so, and just out of curiosity, I was good. So I, I basically had a, a really good feel for how that part of the business worked up, up into ex everything except for just doing actual contracts. You know, sure. that was that was the one thing I hadn't really done. But then by the time I was doing full bleed, I'd done a ton of other kinds of contracts. And so it was not that foreign to me. And but I the, the interesting thing to me is like it came to me at the perfect time because I if full disclosure, I would have been bad at this job 20 years ago. I would not, <laughs> I would I not have been good at this job 20 years ago because it, yeah. it's an absolute ton of work but there are really no hard deadlines. You know, mm. I mean, it, it's, I mean, there are things you want to have happen in a timely manner, but, but, you know, as you, you've been in marketing, you know, or like marketing, sure. editor, like it's, it's everything runs like a daily paper. There's, you know, cons or running trade shows. It's gotta be done by this. It's gotta be done, you know, and I tend to, operate. everything, everything's fine right up until it has to be done tomorrow. Yes. Right. And, yes. And I, Historically, I operate pretty well with a deadline, and I always thought maybe I kind of needed it, to, you know. Sure. Like, but actually, one thing that helped me with that was running Comic Con all those years for you know Dark Horse oh. and for IDW, which is that you, it was such a huge job that if you had any downtime, you realized I better use this wisely because mm -hmm. if all those deadlines hit you at the same time, you're going to be screwed, you know. Yeah. It would be remiss if I didn't mention my cohort Ryan Brewer that helps me out oh. we did really good, a, a two-man tag team at this point but uh you know when he came on board it, it, he has a history in production mm -hmm. and so he helped he, he's great at everything but he helped immensely on the materials and files sides of things right right because that can bog you down like it's just you know sure. it's a ton of stuff i mean when you think about it we have hundreds of books that we license out into dozens and dozens of countries and it's a ton of work, but yeah, the, the, the lack of deadlines is something It's a, it's a different kind of job. And different files would need to go to different, uh, li licensees. Like everybody gets something a little bit different, right? Yeah. yeah. It's in the yeah. You know, I, I described it to someone as I used to get, you know, whatever it was, 2000 emails a day. Like I got, you know, when, when I was in charge of marketing at IDW, it was just crazy. Half of it was spam and what, you know, but sure. it was just, I mean, you've been in those situations where it's just sure. incoming all the time. 
And I was like, now I get 10% of the email I used to get, mm -hmm. but each email is 20 times more complicated. <laughs> yeah, no. So let's talk about those complications because I do think this is interesting. And this is something I have, like I said, I've been involved in negotiating a couple of these deals. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I agree with you. It is a fascinating piece of our, our business. And when people talk about um, intellectual property, you know, and that becomes a dirty word somehow, uh, it's very often a disparaging, I think, of the uh, not understanding, like, what is the value of these books, right? right? And the value is not just, you know, what can we sell in American comic book stores, it's it's what I guess what we can sell to Hollywood, but also what can we license out? Like, how do we license out this thing? Sure. And international licensing is a big chunk of business um, yeah. for for everyone. So, talk about what that's what is that? So you know who that you have the relationships with these uh, foreign publishers, right? Well, they many more now, but yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So they you you either approach them or they approach you about a new title, right? Yeah. What are the pieces of that contract? Like you talk about the contracts being really intricate and detail oriented. What are those pieces that have to be negotiated uh, so intensely, like that need to be spelled out? Well, primarily, I mean, I mean, ultimately, like I said before, you know, I mean, it's we're working on behalf of the creator. So, sure. you know, and different creators have different opinions about all sorts of things. And so, you know, some, you know, sometimes the, however the book is going to be formatted might be really important to a creator and other creators, right. maybe, not, maybe not as much, you know, um, and all the markets are so different that, you know, so that can take a part of it. Ultimately, the financial side of it is pretty quick and easy, which is that it's an advance against royalties, you gotcha. know. Right. So, and it and it becomes basically. I mean, the, this I'm not giving away any trade secrets. It's a, it's a negotiation with with each of these publishers. And so, you know, sometimes there, there's a book that's a hot property, and the, and everybody in a certain area wants it, and there's a little more competition for that. Sometimes it's just sort of, hey, this is our standard deal, and we really like this book, and we do this, and that works. Um, but that's all, it's basically me being between the international publisher, because the other thing is you don't want them to pay too much either because you, sure. you, know, you, you want them to be able to make money and sustain, you know, I, I, I sort of feel like, and I learned a lot from Lance about this back in the day that you want to help these publishers create programs that work for them. You know, you don't, you don't want to drive a publisher out of business. Just like when you and I were doing with, with retail, you don't want to create sure. things and drive retailers out of business, you know, yeah. and that's no good for anybody. You, you, you want to like a sustainable, you don't product. want to sell them more product than they can sell because they're going to just look at that product and resent you from here on out. Right. Right. You exactly. want to, you want to sell them the right amount of product. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same sort of principle to me and licensing that you, you know, you don't want to charge them so much for a book that they're going to be upside down yeah. and can't afford to buy another book and sell another book. So, right. It's that, but then the, the, the flip side of that is you also have to protect the creator's interests and, and their product. And, you know, and obviously it belongs to them and they own it and there's no risk of these companies stealing that. But you want to charge an appropriate amount, you know, and, and yeah. you know, if there's one publisher offering X and someone else is offering a little bit more, obviously you bring that information to the creator and... And sometimes they'll take a smaller deal if it's a publisher they love or they, they really are enamored with the format or, you know, they want to fly them to a show or any sorts of, you know, different, different things. But uh, I don't know. I find the whole process really fascinating. I just, and it is. I, I try to be, and I, 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 hopefully everybody I work with would agree with me though, but like, I just try to be completely transparent with all parties, you know, yeah. and with the publishers and with the creators, like, this is what's happening. This is, you know where we're at and, and make the best sort of marriages you can for all this stuff. And uh, so it's great. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, and this is a, you know, none of my business just pure curiosity. And you know, maybe yeah. I'll ask this when it's not recording, but uh, feel free to like take a pause and, and we can cut it out. Yeah. You're essentially in the arbitrage business, right? You're essentially being, you're essentially taking a, a, an asset and selling it to someone else and you're, you know, negotiating and, and 
you know, hopefully right. maybe occasionally pitting two buyers against each other and, and, you know, and bringing that information back to the creator, like the, you know, this, this, right. what somebody else got, do you, does image itself, like, do you take a piece of that? Is there a percentage yeah, well, of that? Know, it's all coming in. It's yeah. a, it, it is a, it is, I will say this, it is akin to what image does the, the, the overall image deal. Yeah. It's the same for Okay. Licensing. Yeah, that makes it, sense. That makes sense. Yeah, without really yeah it totally makes it, sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, no need to get into details. I mean, that's yeah, none of my no, business. Basically, yeah. So, like, if you are a creator bringing your book out through Image, sure, you know, and are pleased with that deal, yeah, as I think most of them are, then uh, then you'll be pleased with the international deals. It's all the same thing. I got you. I so, mean, be, the only reason I ask is because it occurs to me that like you guys could have made this simple. Like you could have just sold one big deal to, you know, one publisher in every market and they would get, you know, whatever the, the creators, (laughs) but you're putting so much more effort to maximize for those creators. That's what I was asking. There's there's a lot more energy. That sort of thing is tough because, you know, especially for a company like image, because the, the stuff is so varied. You know, right. like there's, yeah. there's, there's so much variety to what we produce that there are, there's almost no other publisher on earth that's just going to be like, oh, yeah, we'll publish all that stuff. Here's a giant check. Certain books just make sense at certain publishers, so, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, it's funny. Every time I think I've got it pegged, I'm surprised. You know, yeah. I'll, think, I'll think a certain book would definitely go to a certain place in France and it's actually, nope, these guys want it more, you know? And so I'll be surprised all the time, but yeah, there's, it's, you know, you think, you think we're wacky here in America. It's wacky everywhere. You know? Oh yeah. Oh, I yeah. know. I know mm-hmm. very, very, that very well. Awesome. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to the end of what I've got for you. I do have a couple yeah. like kind of general questions. Yeah. So where do you think, I mean, you've been in comics now for, 30, 31 years. 31 years. Yeah. Almost. Hard same. Oh, wow. God. How did we get so old, man? <laughs> no. um, um, I didn't realize, by the way, I, I, up until this conversation, I didn't realize we basically started at the same time in basically the same position. I, you said you something know? online at some point, and I was like, well, yeah. you said at the same time I did. Like, yeah, sort of meant to bring That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how how are you feeling? Like we we both talked about how there are ups and downs, right? And where obviously there has been a bit of a down, um, a, a, you know, just recently coming out of yeah. COVID. How do you feel about the comics industry in general and its prospects? What gives you hope for the comics I, industry if you have it? Like a bunch of been... things give me hope actually, and 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 you know, and I should take all of this with a caveat, and that I have not been really involved in the day to day domestically sure. lately but you know it seems to me you, you know when covid hit everyone thought the sky was gonna fall you know i mean not just in comics but everywhere you know yeah and some, some things it did but uh you know then we hit this bubble this unprecedented success that no one could i i didn't see coming you know i mean first we were worried we were going to survive and the next thing you know we're and if you think about it in hindsight, it's pretty easy to go like, of course, everybody's going to stay home and read, you know, and we just, <laughs> yeah. have, you know, passion we finally them. get to sort our comics. That just makes exactly. us want more comics. Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. So it feels like to me that we're just sort of back around where we were pre pandemic level mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. the sky is not falling the, you know, I mean, I, 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 I will say I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, voices of concern coming from the retail community. And I would not want to discount those or, or, or like, you know, not say, say that they're not having a hard time when I believe them when they are true, you know? Sure. Yeah. But I mean, it's just, you know, unlike some other industries, I think comics is uniquely sort of poised to survive because of the sort of nature of the fandom and the nature of the people involved and the, you know what I mean? Like, I, uh, I don't want to be Pollyanna about the real stuff everyone is facing, but there's just, you know, and I'll just say this comics does something for me that that no other medium can do, you know, 
for good or ill. Some people don't read comics, you know, some people, some sure. people don't get the rhythm of it, but if you grew up reading comics or if you know comics or they're, you're excited by them, you can't get that, you know, and, and, you know, no, no offense to digital comics either, but for myself, you know, it's, it's print. And so, yeah. you know, I think it, they'll be shifting sort of, you know, expectations in terms of what it does. But I, I think that, you know, it, I, I think there's a lot to look forward to, you know. I think so too. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what you've been through, you've been through many, you know, I, I feel like I wear a lot of hats. You've worn it as, just as many hats as I have. Um, mm-hmm. w- what was is there like a master skill is there something that has like led you through that did you just are you just oh, man. i mean are you are you just forest gumping your way through this life or is there yeah. like something that you've like you know yes like what do you what do you think is the uh what is the, the key that opened the well, for you? I, you know ultimately I, you know uh, i mean it's just it will sound cliche or what you know but but it is i i think there's a few things i think it, it is a uh, um common sense and a work ethic Not, <laughs> you know and the, the, those things the older I get when and not in comics I don't want to disparage anyone in comics but just in, sure. in life in general when you encounter people with common sense and a work ethic it's like a superpower you know or it's when you're when you're at the airport and you meet someone that's good at their job it's so refreshing not that yeah. plenty of people aren't good at their jobs but I think it basically comes down and then perseverance I think and just, you sure. know, I, I mean, just rolling with it. And then I think being, you know, uh, accommodating and nice and friendly and sort of understanding that, you know, I mean, it sounds like a bumper sticker, like, you know, be, you know, be kind to people because they're fighting a different, everyone's fighting their own war or whatever. Like, I think that's really sure. true. You know, no, I, absolutely. The ability to get along with people. I, I'm sure there are people that there's, you know, 12 people tune in for me. They're going to be like, this guy is full of shit. <laughs> he was an asshole to me yeah, back in uh, 2004. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, and then just you know, I, I think you know, I I never, I on a on a personal level, I never forget, you know, taking out the garbage at a comic shop on my first day. I never forget mm. that you know, I am always thankful to be in this industry as long as I have been, you know, I mean, I, I felt like a, I hit the lottery when I got into comics. I really did. I mean, could, I could not believe my luck. And then sure. I felt that way throughout, you know, and I think, and I think it's easy. Life beats you down, you know, it's a, it really does. And I, I like, for me, it's important to just kind of remember that, you know, yeah. and be inspired by the people around you that, you know, that you can sort of, I mean, like a, what brought up Diana earlier like she was a huge influence sure. on me like just watching her you know the passion she had for the book she was putting out and what she like seeing that you're like I, I want to live that kind of life you know or I actually care about what I'm doing and not everybody gets to do that so I think that that's you know it's important to keep that in mind beautiful beautiful ah. one last question yes. when can we use this opportunity right literally dozens of people are going to watch this Literally dozens. Yes. I know. Uh, it's my family, probably. <laughs> Can you use this opportunity to finally, once and for all, drop the facade and give us that that beautiful tenor voice that you've oh, been God. hiding all these years? That's, uh, come on. No, 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 I'll send you a link to the old videos. You can, there you go. <laughs> Nobody needs Buddy, that. I'm crumbling. Thank you so much for being on. I This Glad has been... Too much fun. No, thanks um, for having me, man. I'm, and good luck with this. I think, you know, we, we joke about dozens of people tuning in. I'm sure there'll be, there are more people interested in the machinations of comics than that. So, you know. I, I sure think. hope so. You know, I'll be happy yeah. with the right dozens. I'll be honest, right? I'll that's, be uh, news, that's for sure. So, at the, at the end of the day, all I'm really trying to do is just raise my, like, comic celebrity up, like, uh, to your yeah, level. You're right? already there. You ever know. get there. You're already, you're already there. <laughs> Where can people find you on social media, and uh, and you know went to where can they hear from the, your musings? Oh Lord, do I want people to find me on social media? I that's, don't know. That's the question. Well, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on I'm, I haven't been on Twitter in ages. I've barely been on there. I'm, I just joined Instagram like this is how bad I am. I joined Instagram like six months ago. 
So, <laughs> but I'm on there. You can, if, you know, uh -huh. you probably follow me on those things. So if you find Adam, you could probably find me. Uh, <laughs> let's let's not go that direction. Oh, That's yeah, not yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Dark Wood. Dark Wood, wherever fine mm -hmm. social media is uh, purveyed. Well, thanks right. again. The, uh, thank the, thank you, man, I it can't. This has been too much fun. Um, Hello again. I hope you found Dirk's insights as enlightening as I did. Dirk is an absolute legend, and it meant so much to our team that he was willing to make the time. What did you think? Be sure to let us know in the comments. Special thanks to Stephanie Girk, who produced this episode, and our research rabbit, Anthony Militano, who dug deep into Dirk's life. Like, literally, there was some of the stuff we couldn't talk about. 